Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Designers at Home. I'm Mark Weaver. It's nice to have you all joining us this morning. Um, I hope everyone is enjoying the nice warm summer. And um, we're, our industry is just in a boom right now. Everybody seems to be busy. Uh, vendors are busy. And we have somebody in the industry who is um, a dynamic force and influencer in the design industry. Um, her name is Windsor Smith, and she's going to be joining us uh, shortly. Let's see, here it is. So um, Windsor should be joining us in a second, if this works properly. Anyway, oh, there you Hello. are. Good morning. Good Hi, morning. Windsor. Good morning How to are you. you. So good. Great. And you? Great. And it's nice to have you with us. Oh, it's nice to be here. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. So I was just um, introducing you. And um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about you because I remember you telling me that you started off your career, you started off as a professional dancer. Well, that was a different career. But yes, that is right. true. That's a true story. <laughs> and you, um, how did you transition from that into the world of design? You know, you'd be surprised how many performers and dancers actually started out in that, you know, industry and migrated over to the design profession. But I think there's an ant trail for sure. But uh, I was uh, kind of looking for a creative occupation outside of that. You know, there's a lifespan to, uh, to the dance life. And um, I really just wanted to have a, a plan B. And uh, so I started working on my own house and loved the process and was shopping around the world for antiques and architectural elements to build into it. And um, it just sort of evolved from there. Oh, that's great. So when did you start your design business? We were talking about that, trying to figure that out and nail it down because it's so long ago. But. Um, I would say early 90s, 1993. Some of you listening weren't born yet. So, <laughs> so Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. I'm at like, mm, I don't know, 50, 60,000. <laughs> and um, you, um, you know, you have a very dynamic career. You're very busy. You have a, we're going to talk a little bit about all the things that you do, your product line and so forth. So, um, people are always asking, you know, professional, how do you balance and juggle your professional life with your personal life? You know, I just, uh, I just kind of said everybody, oh, that's my dog. There's your personal life. <laughs> Let's keep it real. Somebody just got to the front door. Um, I, uh, I think that it was uh, something that evolved, but all of my family is in various uh, uh, stages of development in real estate, uh, real estate uh, brokers. Um, my son has opened his own brokerage agency and uh, both of them actually uh, together. And then uh, I think also we all together um, have, collaborate a lot. And I think they grew up around it. So it was intuitive for them. They witnessed all of it. So I have one that's in architecture school and, you know, one that's out in the world buying and selling and redoing houses um, for himself and also uh, clients. So we just all sort of grew up together with it, really. And um, strangely, you know, that's sort of where we all love to be. And we love that collaboration. Uh, that's, that's really great. It's great that, um, you know, everyone can um, contribute and you can see your, your son's you know, especially in art, where is he in architectural school? Where is he going to school? Woodbury. Oh, that's actually where I went to school. <laughs> oh, there you go. Kismet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was uh, quite, a bit, too, quite a because... long time ago. Yeah, I don't think the school has an interior for... design program today. I think it's mostly it's... architecture, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. But the hours are insane. I said, you're the only person I know that works more hours than I do. Because <laughs> it's just the schooling, the education is incredible. Yeah. So I feel, I, I feel like that really prepares you for this industry because it right. is kind of, we were talking about that the other day, designing and how we fit it all in. And, and you and I decided that we do a lot of it while we're sleeping. Right. 
Well, when I started in design, it was a, it was a different world, and um, it was a very young profession. Today, um, the people that you hire, I hire, are very well equipped, and and they're very knowledgeable, and um, they're just aspects of the business that didn't exist when we started off. You know, all the technical things today, such as audio, video, all the electronics, um, you know, yeah. tech industry, it's just touched every and aspect software, of our business. Even software. We yes. used to have to count all the pieces and now, you know, you have uh, software that can integrate and aggregate all of that information and help you track your projects. And it's sort of, I, I now wonder how we ever did that manually in the past. Oh so, my God, I, I used to, I think um, when I started off, there was no, computers didn't exist and you had to type everything. So every change had to be redone. Today it's, it's easy. Yeah, so Windsor, tell us about how you started your company, um, Windsor Smith Home, and tell us a little bit about the, the company. Well, the company um, ha is multifaceted, um, and especially for a cottage business. Uh, I still consider myself a cottage business. We expanded and had a huge office, and I was absolutely like out of sorts in a way because I felt like there were so many balls in the air and I wanted to be involved in all of them. And I made a decision, a conscious decision that I wanted to contract it again. And, uh, and it was the best move I've made because I'm really engaged creatively, you know, on all of the projects that we're doing. As you know, we do, we have a licensing division, which is robust. And um, so I'm loving now the process of design for that because I'm able to really work it, narrow and deep um, on, the, on that process. And I, the, the result of it has been fantastic. So, um, so that's one division. Uh, we also do high end residential projects. So um, we, uh, that's been a career that's been going on for about a decade. So along with working with my clients who are in various regions, states, countries, um, we're able to craft and carve out some space to be able to, um, for me to design from ground up what I believe is sort of a model for this kind of global family that I find myself repeatedly working for. And so, um, yeah, so we just uh, did the, ha we just did a Tiger Tail and completed that, which sold to an amazing creative. It seems like creatives, only creatives buy my houses. I don't know what that means. But at any rate, so a fabulous songwriter bought the house and, um, and so is, is recording and creating beautiful stuff there. So that legacy is fantastic. So that's kind of something that I love to do. And that's sort of my, um, my you know, one division of our company. Of course, because my husband's in real estate uh -huh. and my sons are in real estate, I got plenty of advisors. <laughs> me, Just what you need more opinions. Yeah, keeping me huh? on the road, you know, yeah. so... Uh, so anyway, so we do that. And then also, you know, I've written bo a book and I'm on my second one right now. The first one was published by Rizzoli. I just happen to have a copy here. Okay. So That's please, great. I just want to tell you the people that contact me and say, when is the next book coming? They all are enthralled with the content and the, and the stories and the anecdotes in here. And I, you know, realized and wanted to write this book one day when I had an epiphany and realized that designers hold with them so much value and so much we what we craft for someone can either create an incredible springboard for them into their life or it could also believe it or not be disruptive and so once i realized it was beyond pretty rooms and it was really about you know navigating lives um i felt like that was compelling and really wanted to write and illustrate that through the, through the imagery so um, book two is an extension of that. So coming soon. <laughs> All right. So so this book um, you published in 2015. It's a it's yeah. a Rizzoli publication. Yes. And, and I was it's lucky enough Homefront to have Homefront Design for Modern Living, right? Yes. Thank you. Right. Yes, for that book. So it's it's a it's a great book. So people that are watching, if you don't have this book, it's something you should have because it's. And really I was terrific. lucky enough. I was lucky enough to have uh, Gwyneth Paltrow write the foreword. She bought one of the houses that I produced from ground up and uh, understood, you know, more than anyone, the ethos of that house. She knew, she said the moment that she walked in the door that it was going to become her home. 
And uh, so that has been, you know, incredible. The, her, her influence is so- well, That's wonderful. So I know that this project was, you're very passionate about this project. It was in Mandeville Canyon in Los Angeles. Can you tell us a little bit about the house? Yes, uh, well, I was kind of thinking about at the time how I felt like technology and our lives were starting to spin so quickly. This was pre-pandemic, but it was all spinning so quickly. I was looking for these ways to economize time so that we could spend more time in our lives. And so I had this thought that I just wanted to build a one-story house. And I was like, my challenge was to build a one-story house that had every luxury that you could possibly want to have on a footprint that wouldn't be taxing, that wouldn't require a huge staff to manage, but would be the highest level of, of luxury. And that is how, that was sort of the, the genesis of that project. And I was talking about it ad nauseum, I'm sure. And my dear friend, Dara Campanaga said, I want to write about this in Veranda. And so she um, basically gave us an issue. And I brought in a lot of my friends from the design community who took different rooms of the house. And we sort of all, the, the mandate was like, how would you set a family up for success? So I think it got a lot of attention. Um, it was one of the first of its kind where it had a robust um, online presence. Uh -huh. uh, and so it was kind of one of those things where I remember when they posted the floor plan before we had started showing any sneak peek photographs about it. And people were going, this is the worst floor plan in the history of mankind. <laughs> and I was mortified. And then by the time it was open for a month, and by the time that it was, you know, the end of the month, uh, architectural firms were coming up with all of their young architects and saying, find out why people keep calling us now and say they want the, the home, House of Windsor design and they want that incorporated into their home. So we kind of, because maybe partly because I wasn't going by a classic uh, idea or floor plan. I was really focused on what would put intimacy back in a relationship if you had kids, like how you could create sacred zones. Instead, we were coming off of that era that I had my kids in, which was like the family bed. Boy, is that a bad idea. But at any <laughs> rate, like, so I was kind of looking for the antidote to how to keep the sexy in your relationship, how to keep communication in the relationship, how to foster, you know, young, great people with great minds that can contribute to the world. And I felt like you could do that through a house. Well, you know, I think um, the best, the most successful homes are ones where you have a great collaboration between the architect and the designer because the designer a lot of times has um, um, a little more acute insight into um, the lifestyle of the, the client. And, um, you know, the today houses seem less structured, less formal than they have, like you say, in the past. And, um, you know, instead of uh, people adapting to a house today, the house adapts to the lifestyles of the people. And so if you can create something from the ground up, it really makes a more exciting, uh, a more dynamic and a more functional house. And I think people are becoming really crystallized in what they need in their home. You know, uh -huh. I, you've got a lot of people who've been sitting at home, working from home. Yes, you know, absolutely. Fooling from home uh -huh. and they're looking around going, you know what, this doesn't make a lot of sense. So right. lucky for our industry, they're looking for professionals now to really help them get you know closer to what will set them up for success. So I think the timing of that book was a little premature. But now that we've had this cataclysm, right, we're right. all thinking about you know those things. I'm looking out to a garden that it would have never you know occurred to me really to plant the amount of garden that I have at this time. And part of it was, you know, being home and having the bandwidth, you know, to really kind of create it. But then also it was this change in the world and wanting to be more, take more accountability for um, our own sources of food, our own, you know, environments. We're really, uh, really taking them on. And just as a designer, you would expect that we do that all the time. Right. But realistically, if you're a really busy designer, it's kind of cobbler shoes. Right. You know, you're the last one to get your shoes done. 
Yeah. And um, so at any rate, I think that that has been uh, so great for the world, actually, that if there is a silver lining to this pandemic. I think it's that bonds have gotten closer, people have gotten, you know, crystallized on whether they need to be where they are in their life. And if it's not working for them, where they need to go. We found this as a time as a company of a lot of transition. I'm usually a company of a lot of young women. So, you know, it was sort of like, put that ring on the finger or I'm out of here. And, or it's, they lived together for the pandemic and then said, oh, this is not for me. And so the, I watched all of these young people sort of really rethinking their roadmap. And, uh, and it's been, and so there's a complete transformation. There's well, I think it's been for everybody, you know, people spending time at home. I mean, it, it has been a boon for our industry because people realize how important their, not only their work environments, but their home environments um, are and yeah. making them not just functional, but making them beautiful. Um, yes. And, you know, um, myself, like you, I need to be surrounded by beauty. I need something that inspires me, that lifts yeah. my spirits. And um, I you think know, that's our been homes kind of, are our sanctuaries. I think that's been kind of undervalued in the past, too. I think yes. that, and also I think it wasn't as democratized as it is now. I mean, you go into Target and there's beautiful design. And that's, to me, I'm so excited about that because I feel like we know as designers how much that can affect you, how much yes, that can absolutely. transform the way you see the world. Uh -huh. And if you, uh, if all people can have, you know, a beautiful, an object of beauty or an object that makes them, you know, inspired around them, they can just create more. They can, they can face humanity in a better way. And I just think there's, it's always a win-win. Yes. So Windsor, do you have a design philosophy or what, what is it that makes a design successful? I think for me, it's about really listening to the client and, and sort of bringing uh, our experience, our um, higher level of aesthetic and uh -huh. our access to creation of product and of uh, whether it be custom or whether it's customizing something that a vendor produces to make it our own. But I think that we're able to elevate what we intuitively know that the client wants and desires, right? So I think that if you're tone deaf to your client and you're just wanting to create what you want to create, I don't think that makes for a lasting um, and successful design experience. I think it's really about having your ear to the floor and, and taking the cues from the client, understanding how they presently live, understand what's not working for them, understand you can tell a lot from someone by their aesthetic and how they present themselves up to yes, the world, right? Yes. So I think you take all of that and you mix it up and then you distill it down and then you just go, that's your springboard. That's where you jump off from. And then our job as designers is to use every access we have to beautiful things and to uh, experience to bring that to life in a bigger, better way than the client could do on their own. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about um, the other aspect of your business, which is you're, you, have, um, you have collaboration with several manufacturers. You, you have a fabric line with Kravit. You um, are working with Century, Mansoor, and several other people. So how, how, did, this get, um, how did this develop? How did you get started in this? You know, it's funny. That's the question I get asked the most. Uh -huh. um, it starts out, it started out always, or it always starts out that you get noticed by manufacturers, right? So basically at one point in time, my very first license deal, I was buying rugs and designing rugs with Kravit. They had just opened a rug division and I was wanting to work with new colorations. And it was at a time where you could find a gold, olive green and, and rust rug everywhere, but you couldn't find anything that was in a mercurial gray. And so I started asking for these colors that they were literally having to cultivate because they didn't have dyes at that time. Mm -hmm. It was like back when wheels were wood, but <laughs> it feels like it. But anyway, I was literally, uh, you know, kind of saying, no, no, more like this. You know, they'd say, well, that's not a real color. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. It's like an in-between color. 
And so I was doing that and purchasing rugs and they were just like, she's buying these big rugs and she's buy, asking for these things that are outside of what we offer. Maybe we should be paying attention. So they sent someone to talk to me about doing a rug collection for them. And when I, when I put it out to kind of demonstrate it to the person that they sent, he said, wait a second, this is a whole concept. I think you should come to New York to present it. So I went to New York and of course I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to hit the big time. And, and I, they, I proceeded to have a meeting on a Saturday morning. No one was in the building except the people that I was meeting with. The lights were all off, only the light on the table I was presenting. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm off Broadway. And, uh, and then I had the good fortune because luck plays a lot into someone's career, I want to say. So I had the good fortune that Scott Kravitz walked through the room and because he was, I think he left his golf sweater or something and was and needed to come by and pick it up. <laughs> and so when he walked by the table, he was, first off, he was kind of shocked we were all there, but then he looked at the table and he was like, what is this? And I, I had planned for my big moment, which is very important to be organized because if you're organized and you know your thought process and you can articulate it, you have a better chance of selling that than Absolutely. if you have your yeah. five minutes of opportunity and you're still trying to develop your ideas, mm -hmm. right? So I whip out my, these you know, layouts of all the colors that I had already created, already done the artwork for, and, say, and he said, my God, this is more than a rug line, this is a fabric line. And so that's how I got my first collection. And had, you, had you have even thought of this as a, as a fabric line? No, yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. And I knew that they were really, truly a fabric house. They were dabbling in rugs. Right. So I knew that the big, you know, the big, you know, moment would be if I could be in fabrics as well. And, and it just paid off. And so that collection was prolific and we kept adding colorways and it was vast right from the beginning. And we just hit that market at the perfect time with these geometric two, you know, one color printed on a beautiful hand of linen and that really sort of set the stage for all my other licensing because it was so widely accepted. It, its price point hit a, a market that it was not like I, it was so aspirational that no one could buy it and they'd relegate it to a pillow. Right. It was so approachable that people were putting it on walls. People right. were putting it, you know, that it went to outdoor. We start, we yeah. push extrapolated it out into an outdoor collection. So. That made a big splash for me where it made, you know, where I wasn't as recognized of a designer, that collection really helped to put me on the map because it was, it had such a vast appeal and it was, it was big fast. So then I think from there, other manufacturers see that and see that you're maintaining that relationship, um, which takes a lot, by the way, it, it is a collaboration. There's a lot of you know, That's a tremendous amount of work. So tremendous when you're designing a line, you know, whether it's century furniture, cravat, fabrics, whatever it is, um, how do you decide what you want in your collection, Windsor? Is it, um, are there specific pieces? Is it a collection? Is it a variety of chairs and tables? Um, do you focus on a particular concept for your fabrics, whether they're um, casual, linens, more you formal? Know, how do you come up with that? I do it very intuitively. I mean, I think all of us are kind of, you know, buzzing at the same, you know, tone and we all kind of see things that influence us culturally in the world, on the planet. You know, it's, there's just sort of things that we all collectively observe on a very innate level. And yes. I think that, so I try to always work from intuition because I feel like if I'm working from intuition, there's a lot of like-minded people that will be moving in the same direction and, and, and the same, having the same thoughts and ideas. Um, and we, you, you have a better chance of kind of hitting the sweet spot. But I also look for like what I'm looking for and can't find, you know, it, it might be that I can find beautiful prints, but I can't find them at a price point where people, I'd much rather people buy my product to, to put, they want them to buy 30 yards to put on a sofa more than I want them to buy one yard to put on a pillow. So I tend to try to, land myself in a place where it can appeal to a broad range of people yes. economically. Uh -huh. So I'm always kind of thinking of that. And what I do is I really collect uh, ideas, moods, colorations. Um, it could be, you know, Chrissy Teigen wearing a dress in this like very pale emerald green at, you know, on the red carpet. But then it could be, you know, the color, some very subtle color that's in a sunset. Like, I don't discriminate at all. I am a giant sponge. 
I'm constantly taking in information and I am, am obsessed with putting it all in compartments. So whenever I go to do a collection, I don't have to sort of have writer's cramp or sit in a room with no ideas. I wait until I know, and I'm in anticipation of getting to that file that I know is pregnant with ideas and color, colorations and thoughts. And then it usually becomes like a really easy process to right. distill that down into a design. So has travel um, been a big influence uh, with you at all? I mean, in I things that you see in your travels and, you know, no. you, like like you, I I travel quite a bit and I, I'm a big sponge. I just absorb everything. And I know that whether it's next week or 10 years from now, something that I see that I think is so incredible, I will save that and, it, and, and I'll use it, um, you know, in the future at some point. So well, can I ask you, how, do you, how and where do you save it? I'm sorry? How and where do you save these ideas from your travel? Well, I save them mentally, but I, um, you know, with me, it's a lot of this is emotion. So it's something that I see. And if it's that dynamic, I don't forget it. But I photograph things and I keep photographs okay, that's what and I was stuff. Curious about. And, um, you know, I have in, in, our, in our database, we have things that if I see a spectacular fireplace or a chair or a garden or a, a restaurant, a presentation of food, place settings, whatever, I'll, I'll file it in our files under that category. And when we're looking for something, then I go back and look at these inspirations yes. that I have. And yes. it's a wonderful reference. Yes. And you think, oh, I forgot about that. I saw that in Paris or in Vietnam or wherever it is. And yeah. it makes it more exciting. And, and, you know, I think the clients love that you can bring something like that to the table that, you know, something that you've Very been personal. so inspired by. Yeah, right? it's very personal. It brings a very personal thing. I'm asking because I am a big advocate of Pinterest, and I don't know anybody who's on here who was looking at the stock market today, but my God, buy Pinterest. I mean, it's just, I'm a big fan. I, don't, I couldn't organize my life without it, and, um, and I'm now looking to it as a resource to be able to push product out because I think that people speak now in imagery. It's a yes. new language. And, Very important. Uh, yes. And so I think that if you can speak, if you're fluent in imagery as a designer, you can create a wonderful audience. And then if you can also take your designs that appeal to that same person who's, whose aesthetic is synonymous with your own, you keep them all in one place. They can go back and forth between, because in Pinterest, you can put your portfolio, you can put your designs from your various license partners. You can put your inspirations there. You can put, you know, anything that you're laying eyeballs on that's moving you. It's almost like people can come and you can rub antennas, you know, to what it is <laughs> that each of you are loving and, and crushing on at the moment. So I'm a big fan of that. And I think it's here to stay. And I can't imagine a designer today, a young designer, not using that as a, as a key right. tool. Yeah. yeah. So do you have a favorite... Um area of design is there do you prefer product design versus interior design is is one area more passionate to you i really love them all you know it's i when i'm knee deep in one i say oh my god this is my favorite but then you know once you sort of like ship the baby off and then you know it's going to go out and you know get get uh get put out into the world and you're pivoted and focused on something else you kind of like, you don't pine, you know, opine for it. You know it's coming, right? So then you can go and shift to something else that you then throw that same amount of energy into. Um, I think that as I, you know, kind of grow as a designer, I'm realizing in the pandemic also sort of was a catalyst for that. I am also realizing that, you know, when you take on a project, and this is to any young designers starting out in this business, and I know you have a lot of students that, that watch this, so... Um, but when you're starting out, you have to realize that the interior design component, about 10% of it is that, you know, endomorphin rush from creativity. Yes. And the other 90% of it is problem solving. It's hard work. Lo logistical planning. Yes. And because there Organi is, I always, Organizing. Organizing. I always say there's one, uh, one project is 1 million decisions. And I'm not, and I'm underestimating. I mean, if you just take drapery, for instance. 
what is the what is the mechanism to hang it from? Do the do the finials are the finials this? Are the finials that? Are they rings? Are they what is it a one inch rod? Right. How is it returning to the wall? What kind of pleat do I want to hem? Is it lined? What's the lining? Do they need blackout? That's one decision in one room. So imagine that extrapolated over, you know, an entire 10,000 square foot house or 3,000 square foot condo. It's a lot of decision making. And then not only do you have to make those decisions, you have to communicate it to your client and then you have to actually make it and deliver well, it. Well, you have to communicate it to a, a, a huge a variety, variety of people. You've got yeah. contractors, landscape architects, um, subcontractors, electrical engineers. I mean, it's, it's a very complex industry today. So well, my point about that is that that is that has always been the mainstay of my business. Uh -huh. And I've had, you know, sort of uh, passive income from other aspects of the business like life. Yes. Thing. I have these houses that we do periodically. So every three or four years, we start another one. So that's, you know, its own division. But I feel like over time, where I see it going for me is, you know, product, once you put it out in the world, that line with Kravit ran for 10 years. So you have a lot of intense design up front, but then once your product is out there in the world, it has a lifespan and it becomes passive um, income. However, you still have to maintain the relationship. You go and if there's high point, then you go and help promote the product. If you release a book, you go out and you promote the book. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the busy work of it happens more on the front end. And then you supplement those designs with other designs intermittently over the years. But so I would have to say that, you know, if I, if I am in this, I'm lucky enough to be in this business for the rest of my life, I would probably let that shift. I would probably be doing less projects, be doing more uh, teaching in terms of helping young designers understand how to, to, to do all of this. And then also uh, tipping the scale more in, in uh, product and less in actual designing of houses. Right. My so, clients won't let me retire. I'm I, sorry? I, my clients won't let me retire. <laughs> no, I mean, not I, that I'm thinking I about it, but I, it's so crazy. I mean, if you really do a good job, they ask you back. And, uh, and I'm on multiple houses, you know. With isn't clients. that the, that's the best thing, isn't it? It's the to highest think that you've done something for somebody that they love so much that they want, want you to do something again. I, I think it's marvelous. And that's one of the great things about our profession, we, we have a variety of things to do, but um, it's, it, it's building relationships. And those relationships are lifetime relationships. I, yeah. We have families of people that we, we work with. And, and I feel so privileged that our business, our work is that rewarding, you know? Yes, it's true. Well, first off, designers are the most fun you can ever hope to have, usually. And, uh, and so I think that if you combine that with a great work ethic and with a beautiful end product, I mean, what's better than that? So, um, you know, one of the things that I'm asked the most, I, I lecture at UCLA to students, but, and, and the age range is young people to, you know, people in their 40s, 50s, 60s who are looking for a career change. And the thing that I'm asked the most is, how does someone break into this business? How do they get in the business? So what is um, Windsor's uh, word of wisdom for this? You know, that's the trickiest part of all um, because it's sort of like you can't get an agent unless you have the movie and you can't get the movie. Absolutely. Unless you're an agent, right? So We've our, all been there. Yeah, and our business is not so different um, from that. So I would say, I mean, if I were starting out and, and maybe coming out of school and having those base skills. Yes. By all means, you got to have some base skills. You've got to really understand scale. That's where most people get in trouble. I mean, that's what schooling is really for, is getting those, those chops, getting that, that fundamental experience to be able to do this as a career. There's a lot that you can learn by rote, which I think the second piece of that puzzle is getting immersed in a design firm where you can see every aspect of the business and hopefully you're not compartmentalized as an, so internships are key. I've had architects, architects will come to our firm and start as an intern because there's so much to learn here. And that's kind of where they come in and sort of look around and we observe them and look at their talent, uh, so their resources. And then 
We try, if they're really, uh, their DNA is there for them to be a part of our unique company, then we uh, invite them to move into a role where we can use them to their best and highest needs. So I would say internships, find companies that you are excited about and yes. you feel like um, are doing something that's exciting to you. And then, you know, make yourself incredibly valuable. You know, That's show, so important. show that you bring yes. value. And yes. I'm telling you, we are so busy. We relate to value. Yes. We relate to someone who you hand them something and they close the circle and they do it with excellent excellence. And they come back and say, how can I help you with this? How can right. I help you? Know, or if it's they're helping a project manager or someone. So. I think that that's um, the more experience you have. I, back to Glad Malcolm Gladwell, you know, after 10,000 hours, you're considered pretty much an expert in what you're doing. So yeah. I think that you, you got to get those 10,000 hours started. Got to right. start somewhere. You can be going to school and doing that at the same time. And that's I'll true. take this opportunity to say we are open to taking in uh, uh, interns at this time. So if anybody's watching and they want an internship, We'll interview you. And what a great opportunity. So <laughs> that's great. Thank you for that. Yeah, you um, So Windsor, tell us what's uh, in the future for you. Do you have, what projects or um, things are you working on? Well, I'm, interestingly, geography is, um, is what opened up a little bit, right? Because for the last year and a half, everybody became sort of, you know, locked in in a way and um, we still worked through the pandemic because we had many projects that were um, in various stages of construction so and interior and in you know installation of the interiors and even though it became almost impossible to get product you know get things yes. shipped uh -huh. get you know full workforces we would have our upholsters you know would unfortunately have to shut down for a couple of weeks because they'd have you know one or two employees that would come down with COVID so navigating those waters was really tricky and still you know staying in the race with our uh, con with our clients to get them in so that i mean was quite an experience but since then you know i wasn't traveling as much to the east coast i had when i got my kids out of the house i started working more on the east coast and in other you know out, out of the country and so forth so now that we had that experience i'm now pushing east again I'm not working as much on the East Coast, you know, Hamptons and all of that. I'm working in Florida, which is a state I've never worked in before. That but market now, is on fire. It is on fire. Yes. So, and, and I'm working with very fun clients there and we're creating jungles and like all kinds of crazy stuff that I haven't done uh, before. I haven't, I haven't worked on a jungle, I'm gonna confess. And so, um, yeah, I'm enjoying uh, that part of the country and its own sort of vocabulary and how can I reinterpret that in kind of a new way for my clients. So, um, so that's been really fun. And then also I'm pushing West into desert. So I'm working in Paradise Valley on a beautiful project. Um, mm -hmm. Fabulous people. Uh, I am loving it so much and watching that bloom has been incredible. So that's my immediate future. I'm also working on a collection with Visual Comfort. Um, I'm very excited. It's an October 23 launch and I'm super excited about that. Uh, it's been an, an amazing collaboration. And, uh, and so other licensing opportunities, I'm working also on my next book, which I mentioned. Um, so that's in my immediate future. And I really am kind of at a place where I would love to um, we are creating a forum in which I'm going to be able to uh, help young designers uh, get their their boots up and get their get, get them set up for success because I think there's so many things that you have to have your contracts, your uh, way of doing business, your way of tracking yes. product. Like there's so much that I feel like we've learned the hard way over years, and that I'd like to be able to create a short path for, for young designers. So I feel like you have to kind of give back if you have Absolutely. This, you know, it's so career. important, isn't it? So important. So yes. I'm, you know, that's, I'm trying to free up bandwidth to really develop that. And then, um, you know, just whatever, you know, I'll still be continuing building houses. I mean, I've kind of got it designed how I like it now. And I feel like I'm able to exercise different muscles with these different sort of divisions of the company. And I just look forward to more of that. So, um, yeah. 
That's well, that's, it. it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had a couple people, um, we can see comments as we're talking. And some people I don't said, have my glasses, so I can't see any okay. comments. I don't know if it they shows can be up going, on your phone, shows up on mine. <laughs> but um, they said, this is very inspiring. And I think that's oh, probably the nicest compliment that you could get. You're absolutely delightful, Windsor. Oh, and likewise. you're very inspiring. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, it was wonderful visiting with you. Thank you. Likewise. Have All a right. wonderful weekend. Thank you. You too. All and right. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Likewise. Bye. Well, that was just really a lot of fun. There's so much more that um, I really wanted to ask Windsor. But um, you can, you can um, look at Windsor's website. It's uh, uh, Windsor Smith Home. And it's a beautiful website and has a lot of information about herself, her product line, and her book. So uh, please look her up. Now, um, one of the questions that I'm asked a lot is, how do you work with contractors and subcontractors? And how do designers um, collaborate between architects and contractors? And what's the best way to hire a contractor? So um, I hope you join us in two weeks because uh, my guest is going to be Mike, uh, Michael um, Grosswent, and his company is All Coast Construction here in Los Angeles. And we're going to talk about all aspects of construction, um, what's the best way to select a contractor, cost, cost overruns, all the questions that people come up with with regard to building a home or whatever it is, offices, home. And he's a delightful guy. He's very knowledgeable and has done some very, very exciting work that he's going to share with us. So please join us in two weeks uh, for Michael. Thank you all so much for joining us on Designers at Home. And, you know, there is a podcast. We have a podcast, Mark Weaver and Associates. So if you're traveling and you're in the car, um, please listen to our podcast. We're also on Instagram Live, Apple TV, and, um, and YouTube also. So thank you again, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.